Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm with Jason Haas, the general manager of Tablas Creek Winery out of Paso Robles. Uh, welcome, Jason, and tell us about Tablas Creek. Uh, thanks, Allison. <laughs> uh, so, this is our 30th anniversary. We're Happy about, anniversary. Uh, yeah, seriously. It's a big deal. 30 years is a long time. It is. We are one of the pioneers of the California Rhone movement. Um, we're co-founded by two families. One of the families is my family. My dad was Robert Haas. He was an importer for the better part of six decades, originally in, in New York and eventually in Vermont. The other family is the Perrin family from Chateau de Beaucastel in Chateau Neuf du Pape, whose wines my dad helped introduce into the U.S. market in the 1960s. And at the same time, he was always a really early believer in the potential of California, and from his base in New York, represented wineries like Kistler and Phelps and Ridge and Chapelet and Spring Mountain in the, the 1970s. All those iconic producers. And they helped launch <laughs> Cinema Coutrere in the 80s. And so... Anytime he had one of the parents with him in San Francisco to sell their French wines, he'd grab them for an afternoon. They'd drive up to Napa and Sonoma, visit wineries, and talk about what they found. And they came to two conclusions. One was that California was a place that was capable of making world-class wines. Kind of a radical idea for a French <laughs> winemaking family in the 1970s. But the second conclusion they came to was that there was a huge opportunity in that California was essentially a Mediterranean climate, and yet nobody was focusing on the grapes from the Mediterranean part of France. Mm -hmm. There was plenty of Cabernet and Chardonnay and Merlot and Pinot Noir. I mean, people looking at Burgundy and Bordeaux as their models, but they didn't see Grenache. They didn't see Syrah. They didn't see Morvedre. They didn't see Roussan, Marsan, Viognier. And they thought that if they could find the right spot, the right soils, the climate would be conducive to doing kind of a Chateau Neuf du Pape style project somewhere in California. Of course, it took them a decade to get the money saved up and the help with their other businesses. But in 1985, they put together a partnership where the two families are equal partners and started looking. And they spent the next four years looking really from the Mendocino coast all the way down to the hills outside of Ventura and ended up in 1989 choosing a 120-acre former alfalfa farm and cattle ranch in the hills west of Paso Robles. And it's important to realize that, that Paso Robles was really the middle of nowhere 30 years ago. I mean, there were a handful of old vineyards there. There's some pre-prohibition vineyards, old Zinfandel vineyards. But the, there wasn't much in the way of a modern wine movement yet. I mean, there were a handful of new wineries that had sprouted up. You had people like Ken Volk at Wild Horse. You had Gary Eberly. Um, you had Justin Baldwin had just gotten started. But it was still really in its infancy. And... They didn't care. They decided that that was where there was the right kind of climate, warm enough and sunny enough to ripen grapes like Morvedre and Roussan that need a lot of heat, but moderated enough to keep Viognier and Syrah fresh. There was enough rainfall to dry farm, and there was limestone. Um, and this was the only place in California that they could find all three of those things. So we ended up in with this former alfalfa farm and cattle ranch um, about... 11 miles west of the town of Paso Robles. When we bought it, we were actually outside the western boundary of the Paso Robles AVA, which we did not know when uh -huh. we bought it. <laughs> um, all of the, the wineries that were out there kind of banded together in like 93 to get the western boundary moved west to include the vineyards that are there, like Justin and us. Did people think you were crazy? Everybody. <laughs> or not necessarily crazy, but the, the general response was, okay, fine, but why are you making your lives so difficult? The soils were a really critical thing. Um, we were looking for someplace that had this highly calcareous, absorbent soil that um, is what the bedrock is underneath those rounded river stones that are famous, the, the galet that are famous mm -hmm. in Chateau Neuf du And you can only find that in the Central Coast. There's none of it in Napa or Sonoma or Mendocino. There's none of it in the Sierra foothills. There's none of it more than about 20 miles from the ocean. So it's this little strip of land that goes between the Santa Cruz Mountains and town of Lompoc, basically, if you draw that line. And that little sliver that's, what, maybe 200 miles long and 10 to 20 miles wide where you're on the Pacific Plate and you got soils like this. Hmm. So they, and this, this is typical of my dad, who <laughs> if the raw materials were there, the rest was just a question for him of persistence. So 
We figured it didn't really matter that there wasn't a wine community there. It didn't matter that there were no Rhone varieties in the ground there. It didn't, that, that wasn't the point. The point was find the right place and work to make the rest of it happen. Wow. Purchased 120 acres. Today, what is your total acreage? And it's all estate fruit. We bought a second parcel in 2011 that's another 150 acres. So we've got 270 acres on the property. We've got 125 of that planted. There's a good chunk of it that's not plantable for various reasons, either oak forest or creek bed or underneath the winery or other things that, that, get, that can't be planted. But we've got another maybe 50 acres that are still plantable, 40 or 50 acres that are still plantable. Wow. And we're in no hurry. I mean, I don't, I, my goal is not to plant every available acre, but <laughs> to have room to grow into and in fact to have play, have space for the varieties that we're continuing to bring in from, from Chateau Nifty Pop. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a huge piece of our story is that the first thing that we did when we bought this property was to go out and import new cuttings of all of the principal road varieties from Chateau Nifty Pop. So you have 13 varieties or more planted? We have more. We have <laughs> we have 16 Rhone varieties. Um, 13 is the famous number that everyone says in Chateau Neuf, but it's, it's not super accurate because they don't count the color variants separately. Ah. So if you want to count Grenache Noir and Grenache Blanc separately, which I really believe you should, mm-hmm. that gets you to 14. If you want to add things like Picpoul Gris and Claret Rose and all of that, you can get all the way up to 18. Um, but we have the 14 that are in the ground at Beaucastel, which are the 13 separating Grenache Noir and Grenache Blanc, plus Viognier and Marsan that aren't allowed in Chateauneuf, but are allowed in Cote du Rhone just across that line. Okay. So we've got 16 Rhone varieties and a few other little experimental things. But we didn't import all of these at the beginning. I mean, uh-huh. we started with the main ones, Grenache, Syrah, <laughs> Morvedre, Cunoise, um, Roussan, Marsan, Viognier, Grenache Blanc, and have been adding to that collection over the last 30 years. And one of the things that I'm super excited about is that just this year, we have three varieties that we got into production for the first time. So we have the first ever, for our first production of Sanso, Ooh. the first production in the central coast of Bourbalanc, and the first co- first production anywhere outside of France for Vacarez. Um, exciting. It's super exciting. <laughs> uh, and then we have the, the wow. very last of those 14 Chateauneuf varieties we grafted into the vineyard this year. So Muscardin, which was the last one, that we'll get a crop off of next year. So we'll have them all. So many fun grapes. Ooh, exciting. You've got an exciting 30 years ahead of you. I, that's right. <laughs> As you look back. I, it's, I, that's why I feel like, I mean, 30 years is the point. In some ways, it's not. It's at least the end of the beginning. Like yeah. we're through the formative stages of Tablas Creek, but I absolutely agree. I think the next the next few decades are going to be super exciting. What's your total production? We make about between twenty six and thirty five thousand cases a year, mm-hmm. depending on what the weather gives us. About seventy percent of that is off of our estate. The other thirty percent is in the three Patalenda Tablas wines that we do. Um, where we source fruit from other vineyards in Paso Robles to whom we sold vine cuttings. Okay. And Patelin is French slang for neighborhood. So sort of our wine from our neighborhood, it gives us a wine that restaurants can pour by the glass or that people can use to introduce their customers to the category that we're a part of. Ah. And your wines are available across the U.S.? Are they available in France? They are newly <laughs> available in France. Um, because we are represented nationally by Vineyard Brands, which is the import company that my dad founded, they have relationships with distributors in every state. That doesn't mean that every state actually has inventory on the wines or that you can walk into a wine shop in Mississippi or Utah or, <laughs> or North Dakota and, and be able to find them. But at least there's a, a distributor that we have a relationship with that if somebody asks for them they can get them. Mm -hmm. Export is not a huge piece of what we do. It amounts to somewhere between 5 and 10% of our production each year. But we use the network of agents that the parents have around the world. And that does mean that we actually sell a little bit of wine in France, which is (laughs) is kind of exciting. (laughs) Well, tell me, so we were talking before you were in high school when your dad bought this property. He was working in wine, so you obviously grew up around wine. What's your first memory relevant to wine? Interesting. So I, I was three years old. And <laughs> it's pretty much. I mean, I when I was really little, the whole family went. My dad was was spending a couple of months of the year in France. I mean, he, his main job for Vineyard Brands was to go and source the wines that were going to be a part of the portfolio and then come back and make sure that he had relationships with distributors in states that could sell those wines. 
So he was spending a couple of months of the year in France every year. And the rest of the family just came along. I, there, there's this great picture of me at Bocastel from 1973, which is the year that I was born, um, <laughs> sitting as this like six-month-old, fat-cheeked, little red-headed baby on Jacques Perrin's lap. So I know I, I, I spent a couple of months of the year in France until my sister was born when I was almost five. And I do have memories of being at the... The, the house at La Vieille Ferme, the, the Perrin's house, and playing with the, the Perrin kids who are all in my generation also. And that's a super early memory. It's not exactly about wine, but it's about uh, wineries. Yeah, well, no, uh, of course. And having a dad who was a wine importer tended to mean that if I didn't have a summer job, I got sent to France to work at a vineyard. Oh, you poor thing. It was terrible, <laughs> right? No, it was, it was, it was wonderful, though... <laughs> If I if I never have to restack another bottle or light a sulfur candle in another barrel, I'll, I'll be okay with that. <laughs> um, but the the introduction to to wineries and winemaking was not very glamorous. It was a lot of cleaning hoses and pumps and barrels and tanks, which is honestly what the nitty gritty of of making wine is is often about. So this is probably a really unfair question to ask. I always ask after I ask about your first memory of wine is what is the most memorable wine you've ever drunk. Uh, considering the pedigree that you grew up around, is there one wine that stands out as sort of an aha moment or that sort of pushed you into a new direction from where you were? And do you remember the occasion? Or are there just too many? Uh, there are a lot. <laughs> there is, there's one that I think is particularly memorable. I don't know if, how familiar your, your listeners will be, but my dad passed away about a year and a half ago, so last spring. And we had a... A, a kind of a celebration of his life at the vineyard. He had a great and long life. He was almost 91. Oh, he was active yeah. and productive um, right up until the end, sharp up until the very end. And so it didn't feel like we were all sad to lose him, but it didn't feel like a, a time to mourn as much as a time to, to kind of look back and look back and be thankful and celebrate. Yeah. And so my brother, who took over big chunks of the import business from my dad when he retired from that, gradually in the 80s and 90s was out also it was just just family um, and we dug through the the older wines the older burgundies that he had in the cellar and one of the ones that we picked was a domaine uh, Marquis d'Angeville Volnay and Jacques d'Angeville was my dad's closest friend from his importing career they were born in 1927 the same year and he was somebody who he worked really closely with over the course of several decades and we found an 85, a beautiful 85 Volnay that we sort of opened and got a chance to reflect on how kind of genius can outlive its creator, which felt like an appropriate sentiment to have. Oh, that's beautiful. And I'm sure that memory will live for a long time as, as part of a celebration of your father's life. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, so I can only imagine if I asked you if I were to come to your home and go into your cellar, I can't even imagine what gems would be found there. But would we find a smattering of wines from around the world or particularly a lot of Rhone? What, what would we find in your cellar? It depends on how recently I've scavenged <laughs> something out of my dad's cellar. Um, so there's, there's a couple of things. There's things that I really love. I try to always make sure that I have kind of the, the high acid whites that I really like to drink. I mean, things from the Loire, um, Chablis. I always try to make sure I have good Rieslings around. I love, I love Pinot Noir. You'll, mm -hmm. and you'll find a lot of Burgundy, red Burgundy. You'll find a lot of California Pinot Noir um, at my house. You'll find a lot of wine that's made by friends. I mean, that's, I think that's always the way it is. When you, <laughs> when you're part of a wine community, you end up with a lot of wine that you, that you have that was just brought over to one function or another by, right. by friends. <laughs> so there's a lot of the members of the, the Central Coast Rhone community who, who are friends, and there's a lot of that in my house. Mm. And then there's the, the smattering of the great, like the old Burgundies and, and Bordeaux that Vineyard Brands represents, and then whatever it is that I'm, I'm, I'm getting newly excited about. <laughs> I always try to make sure that I have a, I have a wine resolution every year that I want to keep. So a couple of years ago, it was 
have enough Chablis around the house that I don't feel guilty opening it when I just want a good glass of wine to drink. Hmm. Like these are these are the kinds of resolutions I want to make as I <laughs> enter the new year. But I always try to make sure that it's something different each year so that I'm not stuck in my own little bubble. Huh. So what what are you um, sort of on right now? What do you what has been your resolution that you're holding true to? What what's drinking really well right now out of your cellar? So this year's resolution was have more champagne. Hmm. So I I have I have succeeded in half of that. I've succeeded in the actually have more champagne around the house. I don't think that we've been as good as as we should have been in opening it more often just because we have it. Uh-huh. But it's like one you have to have one before you get to the other. Right. Um so there's that and then I the the other thing that I've been really on a kick of recently is is gamay looking at some of these fresher, juicier, lighter bodied reds. Um, I mean, I love, I've always really loved Beaujolais, but I haven't made an effort to kind of wrap my head around it in mm-hmm. a, in a serious way. So that's, that's probably what I've been opening more of than, than, than I have in the recent past. Is it a fair question to ask red, white, or rosé in terms of preference? Not really. I mean, or it's not that it's an unfair question. It's just that, it's just that I don't, I don't have an easy answer. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I don't, that often open a, a bottle of red if I'm just pouring myself a glass. Mm-hmm. I drink a lot of dry rosé, drink a lot of white, and then it's a question of what I'm eating and what I'm having it with. Well, so how do you approach food and wine pairing? Do you follow rules or do you sort of pick the wine and then are there rules that you follow or sort of protocols that you think for a food and wine pairing or is it really what you want, what you're in the mood for? I try to let the food dictate the wine. I I don't feel like starting with the wine and then designing food around it just doesn't fit with the way that I I wrap my head around meals. I do think there are things that work and things that don't work. I think it's a really good general rule to try to look to the traditions of a place. I mean, if you're having a wine, if you're having a a meal that has, for example, a lot of um, kind of classic Mediterranean flavors, you're probably going to have better luck pairing that with a wine from some part of the Mediterranean tradition than you are something from Bordeaux or something from Burgundy. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing if you're doing something with a whatever a cream sauce, um, you're probably going to want to look at something in that Lyonnais tradition, looking at, looking at a Burgundy. Or, mm-hmm. That said, I think people often get too hung up on the, the idea that there is a right pairing, whereas really there's almost always going to be a bunch of good pairings. And each pairing may bring out something different in the food and the wine, but it's all a process of kind of discovering the different layers that the food or the wine will have. So when it comes to different wines uh, and to grapes, um, you're growing 14 plus different grapes. Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? No. No. <laughs> it's again a little bit like food and wine pairing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are grapes that are the wrong grapes for a particular place. There are grapes that are generally more flexible, are going to be good in more places. But there are, I mean, the grapes have so many different personalities and um, they have different abilities to reflect the place in which they're grown and the hand of the winemaker. I mean, one of the reasons Chardonnay is so ubiquitous is that it's a little bit of a blank canvas Mm -hmm. um, and it can show a lot of different things depending on where you put it and what the winemaker wants to do with it. Mm -hmm. There are other grapes that aren't like that. So for example, Viognier, it is what it is (laughs) with very well-defined personality. And if you try to make it into something else or try to have your, your fingerprints show on it, they stand out in a way that's maybe not what you would want. Yeah. But I think one of the things that's great about the world of wine is that there is that diversity. There's not a right grape for everywhere. And in in fact, there is, there are, I don't think it's reasonable to think that even if you know the very specific place that you're only going to have one or two grapes that are going to be right for that. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of the diversity of wines and, and, and everything that's out there, what's your take on wine critics and scores? We have the luxury that we've been established for long enough that I can look at wine critics and scores as essentially just upside. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like it's every wine can be a a difficult, challenging, intimidating space, particularly for people who haven't spent a lot of time in it. Mm -hmm. And 
if they can find someone who generally whose recommendations their their palette lines up with and then that person will write about new stuff it's a great way to discover things you wouldn't otherwise discover mm-hmm. it's also a great way to help make a decision if you're trying to decide okay i know i want to lay down a, a couple of cases of red burgundy this year mm-hmm. Which ones do I want to do? Well, okay, you open up whoever the your your favorite reviewer is for that particular region. You have some good idea of which producers did particularly well in a year, which what the difference is between one vintage and the next, and what the specific reflection of a of a of a terroir or a particular cuvee in a particular year is. Mm-hmm. I mean, critics have the ability to go out and taste so many more wines than I. Even I, I mean, I taste a lot of wines, <laughs> but I mean, a, a critic who's reviewing whatever hundreds of wines a week right. um, has so much more ability to get that bigger picture than than I would. At the same time, I I don't feel like we have either had to or felt that it was beneficial to try to have our principal audience come because of the scores that we get. Mm-hmm. Um, we want people to feel like they're they understand what goes on at Tumblr Street. They're a part of the the thinking. They when they come and visit, they're brought inside the process. Um, the wines are designed to 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 show what the year is like, to show what the vintage is like, show what the varietal is like, show what we really love about that year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have the we really have the luxury of kind of dedicated fans who are interested in following the the journey that we see on a year to year basis. And, and that's something where that's maybe a little different than like, did it get a 97 this year? (laughs) Well, speaking of that kind of journey of what a wine goes through each year and from vintage to vintage, you've been intimately familiar for 30 years with your property and, and watched it grow. Do you think we know that there's variation from vintage to vintage, but do you think there are things, more things that repeat themselves or more uniqueness from one year to another? We're still waiting for a year to repeat itself. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the thing, what's the what's that old rule that in order to do, in order to be expert at something, you have to do it 6,000 times mm-hmm. or something? We, we get one shot a year to make the wines. And every year is the is the accumulation of a whole bunch of, of individual conditions, mm-hmm. whether that's something as macro as temperatures high or low rainfall high or low but there's a lot of smaller things of exactly how the timing comes of the heat and the cold when it rains if it rains do Um, you use any of these things as predictors of what kind of vintage you will have no no it's all retrospective so basically i want to understand why things happen Mm -hmm. but we try to make sure that we always make our wines just by looking at what's in front of us so um, the first thing that we do in our blending trials, which is the kind of the main winemaking, our main winemaking moment mm-hmm. in the spring, we'll taste blind all of the lots of a particular grape. So we'll taste 18 Morvedra lots, and then we'll taste 15 Syrah lots, and 18 Grenache lots, whatever it ends up being. And I don't want to know that this particular lot came from the top of the hill that w- went into our top wine last year, and that other lot was the last pick of that east facing slope that we felt like never gets quite right. Mm-hmm. I don't want to know that there's whatever 600 gallons of this and only 40 gallons of this. I don't want to know any of that. All right. I want to know is that these are more better. Um, and we'll go through, we'll sit around a table. There's usually six of us around the table. And the first thing we do is give them all grades. Mm-hmm. And our grading system is not complicated. It's <laughs> one, two or three, but uh, one means it's got to be rich and yet elegant, balanced, age worthy, probably a candidate for the Esprit which is our top QA. Mm-hmm. Two means we like it, but it's not Esprit for whatever reason. Maybe it's so varietal in character, we think it's not going to blend well. Maybe it's super structured and tannic and powerful. It's going to need a lot of time, uh, but the structure is good structure. Or maybe it's super juicy and outgoing, but we feel like maybe it's not going to age well enough. So those are twos. Um, and those often, if they're super varietal in character, they'll end up as varietal bottlings. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they'll end up into one of our other blends. Um, and then threes means there's a there's a potential issue with this wine. It's maybe it's not done fermenting, or it's oxidized, or it's reduced, or and those are things that we'll 
be able to fix usually in the cellar with a little bit of attention. Mm -hmm. They resolve themselves into twos or sometimes even ones. Occasionally there's a three that we just don't feel like has the level of interest and concentration that we want that gets sold off and never sees a, a tumble screen bottle. <laughs> but that the, the process that we use starting first with just what's in front of us, I think helps keep us grounded we're not trying to be like, well, this was kind of like 1999 when, mm -hmm. because that was when we got that rainstorm on October 20th and we ended up choosing a wine with this particular percentage. Like, I don't feel like our ability to really measure the, the same things that the vines are measuring is good enough for that to be a useful way to go about it. I want to look at what's in front of us without stripping away as many of those preconceptions as, as we can, mm -hmm. and then make what we feel like is the best wine that we can make from what's on that table. So represent the vintage, but not try to represent last year's version of that wine. I, I feel like it just gets you into trouble yeah. because the, the vines are measuring things like that every day and every hour of every day. They're reacting dependent, based on the, the, the sun, the heat, the cold, the water. And our ability to measure those things is pretty rough. I mean, we have a weather station in the vineyard where we've been keeping hourly weather data for 23 years. Mm -hmm. And still, our ability to, to, to know exactly what it is that's impacting the vines is limited. So it's much safer to, to pay attention to, to, their, to what they're saying. Yeah. So for somebody who hasn't tasted Tablas Creek wine yet, I find that hard to believe, but if somebody hasn't tasted it yet, what do you think they're missing out on? So... Our idea is to translate kind of the inspiration from Chateau Nifty Pop into California. Um, so if you haven't had Tablas Creek, but you have had wines from Chateau Nifty Pop um, or Cote you're on the you're on the right track. <laughs> um, our our goal beyond that is to show off the things that we really love about the place that we're in, and that's something that the Perens have done everywhere where they've where they've worked. Um, it's not take this model and apply it blindly. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it seems like this overall model should be a good fit. Start with that and then adjust based on what you learn. Mm -hmm. So we, one of the first adjustments that we did was we realized that the area where we were in Paso Robles turned out to be much better for whites than we ever thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, Chateau Nifty Pop is mostly red wine country, 96 95% red, something like that. Mm -hmm. Bocastel has a little bit more white than that, but they're still less than 10% white. And our original plan was to plant 85% red and 15% white. Wow. The whites in the early years had such great freshness and brightness that we're like, we need to plant more whites. So we planted 20 more acres of whites in 2000. <laughs> so we're now like 50% red, 35% white, 15% rosé. Huh. Um, and so if you're you're thinking of what the differences are between like that old school Chateau Neuf model and what, what you might taste at Tablas Creek... Um, I do think that that the cold nights in Paso Robles and the limestone produce a little bit of a brighter profile. We get a little higher acid when we pick than they do in Chateau Neuf. We, we have more sun. We have about 320 days of sun a year in Paso Robles. The Rhone, which is the sunniest part of France, is still only about 250 days of sun. <laughs> so I feel like you get that kind of primary expression of fruit and acid um, in a more direct way than you do in a lot of wines from the Rhone. Where in the Rhone, people often talk about that kind of wonderful, earthy, spicy, garigi character that the wines have. And you get those in the wines at Tablas Creek too, but it often takes a few years for that to come out past the, the kind of purity, brightness of the fruit acid balance. Mm. But overall, I think that for the fundamental idea that my dad and the parents had that this place was going to end up being a really good location to do a Chateau Neuf du Pop riff uh, turned out to be right. So if space aliens were to land on your property, which of your wines would you want to present to introduce them to Tablas Creek? <laughs> <laughs> this is appropriate, of course, given the whole like cigar volant, Chateau Neuf yes. du Pop, space aliens thing. Um, <laughs> So our, our flagship wines are the Esprit de Tablas and the Esprit de Tablas Blanc. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we really, we have, two, we have two wines. Oh, they're lucky. They get two wines. They do. They get a red <laughs> and a white. It depends on, depends on what, uh, what, what species they're choosing to eat. That's right. No one should ever have to choose between red and white. <laughs> so 
Though, those are the wines that we make kind of in honor of the, what the parents do at Bocastel, mm-hmm. you know, the, in honor of the Bocastel Chateau Nifty Pops. So the Esprit Red is a Morvedra driven Chateau Nifty Pop inspired blend. So Morvedra, mm-hmm. Grenache, Syrah, and Cunoise. The, the Esprit Blanc is the white version of that led by Roussan with Grenache Blanc and a little bit of Picpoul and in the last couple of years tiny bits of two of our new grapes Picardin and Claret Blanche. Mm. So 30 years you've been making wine. 30 years a tradition has been built and grown. Do you guys have any, any, any traditions or things that you do at the start of Harvest as a team? Any sort of I don't know. Yes. Funny, silly, or uh, superstitious beliefs. <laughs> so I, we are we are um, refreshingly not superstitious, I okay. would say. <laughs> um, but we do. Uh, we always have a little bit of new blood in the cellar every year. We always bring in a couple of interns to to work, <laughs> and it's the beginning of a pretty intense couple of months. Mm-hmm. So um, typically, since we have nothing in the cellar yet. Um, the whole cellar crew goes out and helps pick the first pick. Um, So it's not just our vineyard crew, but Mm -hmm. the whole cellar crew will go out and pick with them. And then when we come back and when we crush it, everybody is, uh, is encouraged to bring a bottle of something sparkling. And we have a mass sabering where everybody in the cellar and vineyard crew will bring a bottle of something sparkling, find some tool. If they haven't done it before, we'll get some (laughs) instruction. And so we have these great videos. If you, you can go and look on the, on the on Thomas Creek social media, and you can see like fifteen saberings happening at once with everything from the knife that we use to carve the leg of prosciutto that we have in the in the the lab during harvest to the wrench that we use to to attach the. You have a leg of prosciutto in your lab. Yes. Yeah. Doesn't everyone? I don't know. It usually takes two to make it through harvest. I like. I, I could just imagine in the lab. You're like, let's measure this. Let's see the sugar levels on this. Who slice me a little prosciutto? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> ah. So okay. So you have a leg of prosciutto. You saber bottles of champagne or sparkling wine in the cellar. You um, go outside. It's a big mess if you're in the cellar. Well, that's true. <laughs> okay. So I know you said you're not very superstitious, but have you? Do you ever walk through the vineyards and talk to your vines, or do you talk to the wine when it's in barrel? Not or, really. No, not superstitious at all. No, not like that. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, if I'm if I'm walking through the vineyard talking to the vines, it's uh, it's generally I'm talking to myself. <laughs> it may be of indistinguishable <laughs> from people looking from the outside, um, but no, we don't like play certain music to the wine as it's fermenting or. That's not not the way we roll. So how old were you when you knew you wanted to work in the wine business? So I grew up around wine people and it's a really, it's a, it's a world which is full of nice people. So I always thought that in the end I would end up somewhere in that world, but I didn't see myself going out and selling other people's wines. And that was when I was growing up, it was the import business that was really salient. Mm Tablas Creek didn't get started till I was in high school and we didn't have any grapes until I was in grad school and it was all very abstract in the early stages. What did you study in college and grad school? I studied architectural design and economics as an undergrad and then the architectural turned out I was more interested in the way that communities developed over time than I was in designing buildings Mm -hmm. and ended up getting a master's degree in archaeology. So I spent two summers on a dig in on the Greek mainland uh, digging up an old fishing village. So So you had other aspirations. Well, not so much aspirations, other interests Mm -hmm. for sure. And I didn't want to go straight into a family business right out of school. I didn't feel like I would come with enough. Mm -hmm. Um, So the grad school was a chance for me to travel and teach and work on languages while Tablas Creek got a little more established. um, And also while I kind of got my feet under myself. Um, and I ended up getting recruited out of grad school to join a, a tech startup because this was the tech bubble. And mm-hmm. if you could turn a computer on and complete a sentence, you were qualified for a job in the industry. Yes, I worked in it. Yes. <laughs> Pre-wine. <laughs> um, so I, I got recruited to join this little tech startup that taught web programming languages. I was based in Washington, D.C. I joined this company. I was the seventh employee. And by the time I left four years later, we had 80 employees and offices in six cities. And I'd gotten a chance to manage people and manage projects and write and teach and market and 
make a million mistakes. I mean, I was 25. The guy who founded the company was 28. Everybody it was everybody's first or second real job out of college. Mm -hmm. And I went thinking I would get, at the very least, this useful technical education and ended up leaving having gotten business school. So that I did through 2001. Um, and at that point, Tublis Creek had grown from being a project into being a business that really needed somebody to pay attention to it. Um, and it turned out that we had really underestimated a lot of the challenges of producing a wine without really an established category from a part of California that people didn't know from grapes that they'd never heard of and couldn't pronounce. And it was the, 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 the business side of making this work turned out to be more of a challenge than we thought. So my dad asked me to move out asked me, I had gotten to the point where I was, I had gone as far as I was going to go in that company. Mm -hmm. um, and I was getting married that summer and I knew I wanted to work with him. He was already in his, in his seventies. And so I didn't want to wait, like take another job, wait five more years. And then something happens to him. And right. So it seemed like the right moment. We were, we, we were ready. So we moved out in April of Oh two. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I recall, I think the first time we met was in around that time. And I was just a layoff from the dot com world and had started in wine as well. So Back in 2001, 2002. <laughs> Amazing how many of us did that little journey. And we haven't aged today. <laughs> when you're not working uh, in wine and running the winery, what do you do for fun? Well, I got two boys who are 14 and 12. Uh -huh. um, I co I've coached them in both basketball and baseball for the last several years. They're, they're both getting to the age. I have like one more season left before they age out and they're in high school. And I want nothing to do with you again. <laughs> well, so far so good. But at the very least, I don't feel qualified to coach them anymore. Um, so we spend a lot of time with family. We try to we try to get out and, and see some of the world when we can. We did a, a National Parks trip this summer where we drove to like Grand Canyon and Zion and Bryce Canyon and all of that. We've taken them to, we didn't do it this year, but we've taken them to, to Europe three out of the last four years and try to do that. I played ultimate Frisbee competitively for wow. for better part of two decades. So I still try to get out and run around when I can, try to get out and enjoy the enjoy the beautiful Central Coast, get out, go for a hike or a run or hmm. all that. And um, when you plan a romantic evening with your wife, what sort of wines do you pull out for that romantic <laughs> evening? It's really funny because we met freshman year in college. Uh -huh. So um, she's... <laughs> Like her entire journey of wine has basically been with me. Right. So she um, has a really high bar set. And <laughs> it's it's funny that she still like her early memories of wine are of sitting around our family dinner table in Vermont when we were both in college with my parents and like candles and like nice, nice dinner and mm -hmm. old bottles of wine from my dad's cellar. <laughs> so for her, that's like, that's the apex is uh -huh. an old bottle of Burgundy or Bordeaux or something that, that feels like that formative stage of, of her discovery of wine and of our relationship both. Uh huh. And yet what gems she was drinking at that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and like, whatever, everybody grows up thinking that what they're doing is normal, but right. like it was pretty clear from her reaction. Like this is not normal. <laughs> like, <It's> fantastic. <laughs> when, when you think back at, you know, the years you've worked in the wine business or even prior to the wine business, was there one piece of advice you were given that sort of you've lived by and who gave it to you? Yikes. Um, I don't think that there really is anything kind of singular like that, that, that I feel like I go back and look to again and again. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there's lots of things that I, lots of examples that I find inspiring and, and, and memorable. Mm -hmm. And I know that looking at the way that, that people would talk about my dad, mm -hmm. um, is something that's had a lot of meaning and the things that they, the fact that the things that they talk about are his, his kind of belief that you do you do the right thing in the right way and the rest is just a question of perseverance. Mm -hmm. um, and that like that really matters, but he never he wasn't the type to sort of come out and say that. Yeah. He led by example. Yeah. <laughs> he was not somebody who really liked the spotlight. It was not somebody who was super comfortable like being pronouncing. Uh -huh. um, well, I'm going to make you pronounce one thing. 
If you look back at your career, what would you say is your proudest achievement to date in your work? You get to brag once. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to date, I would say that my proudest achievement is... Well, I'm going to answer this in two ways. Okay. So sort of our proudest achievement as Tablas Creek for me was being recognized with one of the inaugural California Green Medals that the California Sustainable Wine Growers Alliance gives out. They give out four each year mm-hmm. to wineries that kind of exemplify sustainability across their farming, their community relations, their innovations. And to be one of the original wineries to be given that when they created the award was I thought a huge, huge recognition of something that we believe is really critical. For myself, um, I mean, we've, uh, as, a, as a Paso Robles wine community, mm-hmm. um, we, we get, uh, whatever, there's different awards that the community puts together and votes on. Mm-hmm. And to find out that I had been voted by the other members of the community as the wine industry person of the year a couple of years ago. Ooh. And to have my dad and me be the first time that two members of the same family have both gotten that award was that was pretty exciting wow and he was alive to see that too so that's fantastic yeah it was was 20 he got his in 2007 and mine was in 2017 wow well congratulations thanks (laughs) so complete this sentence for me a table without wine is like (laughs) breakfast (laughs) Wait, you don't drink wine at breakfast? Really? No. No, I'm not a huge fan of uh, breakfast wine. Except on Sundays with a mimosa or some champagne. (laughs) Smacks of desperation. Right. (laughs) I want you to imagine a scenario. Paparazzi are shooting um, pictures of someone sitting in a restaurant drinking a bottle of your Esprit Red. It's someone famous from any walk of life. Who would you want that person be drinking your wine? (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Um... I don't know. I'll pick somebody realistic. Not that I, not, <laughs> not that I would know that he would do it. But um, I would think it would be awfully cool if, say, that were LeBron James who were doing that. I mean, I know he's a pretty serious wine guy, and just the visibility that that would produce that would be, that'd be pretty great. And I, I always feel like there are certain athletes, and I'm not. I mean, I grew up in in New England. I'm a Celtics mm-hmm. fan, but. I feel like there are certain athletes that were just kind of privileged to be alive, to get to watch them perform. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's one of those ones for me. So hopefully he'll hear this and <laughs> run out and buy a bottle of Tablas Creek. I would love to give him an insider's <laughs> tour should he want to see how it's made. Well, he doesn't live far from Paso now, so. Right. <laughs> I know that you, you were talking about how you're, you've gotten awards for being green and that uh, sustainability is obviously something very important to you. Where do you think we'll be in 500 years' time? Do you think we'll still be drinking wine, drinking the wine we're familiar with now? I mean, where do you think we're where do you think we're headed at this point? I mean, I can't see 50 years down the road, let alone 500. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I don't. I, whatever, I can't even imagine. You think of how different the culture now was from 500 years ago. Mm-hmm. That's that's too far ahead for my crystal ball too to far. feel like it, it exists. Even, <laughs> I mean, I do. One of the things that I do see happening over the next few decades, though, is we're just scratching the surface in California with the grapes that are, are made into great wines around the world. I mean, there are now 300 grapes or something in California, 300 wine grapes in California. Mm-hmm. Yet most Americans can name five. Right. My, most wine drinking Americans can name five. <laughs> so based on the success that we've seen with some grapes that are obscure in France, I think there's so much opportunity for discovery of things that for whatever reason, maybe they never were super popular in Europe, but they may be great where we are. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, let me give you an example. Yep. So we planted half an acre of Picardon in mm. 2013. Never heard of it. The half acre that we planted increased the world's footprint by 40%. There's 1.2 acres in Chateau de Fupin. It's a grape that would almost certainly have gone extinct if not for Jacques Perrin, who went in in the 1950s went and found the grapes that had historically been been grown in Chateau Nifty Pop but had been lost during the phylloxera epidemic found where they'd survived brought them back regenerated them at the vineyards of Beaucastel and then made available cuttings to the French nursery system so that mm. they could then be be propagated and uh, and and go back out into circulation so 
It turns out that Picardin was a fairly widely planted grape in the first half of the 19th century in the south of France. But it turned out to be susceptible to powdery mildew, Mm -hmm. and so was already in steep decline by the time phylloxera came through in the 1880s. And then when people were replanting in the early 20th century, they were never going to replant with this grape that had the powdery mildew problems. So it got, it was almost entirely lost. Mm -hmm. The only places where it survived were in old vineyards where they'd never had to replant because it was a high enough sand content that phylloxera couldn't live. Mm -hmm. So that was where Jacques found it and brought it back. It turns out that we we don't really worry about powdery mildew in California. Mm -hmm. It makes beautiful wines. It's got this great kind of saline minerality, nice, like lightly tropical fruit, little bit pineapple-y, super elegant and bright and pure and precise. It's gorgeous. Mm. So the reason why it turned out to fall out of popularity in Europe had really nothing to do with how good the fruit was. Right. Certainly not to how good the fruit can be in a place like Paso Robles, California. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be the most exciting development over the next few decades in California wine is that All of these grapes that may well be unknown now or or known only to a very few people in a very specific part of the old world, you're going to have this proliferation of new potential. Right. Ooh. You have me licking my lips. I want to try this wine now. (laughs) Delicious. Delicious. Think of it as as a a little bit gentler version of Picpoul, and you're probably... And, And to something you said earlier, and it is something that I've noted... I have been loving the white wines coming out of Paso Robles, like absolutely adoring them. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm thirsty. <laughs> um, it's worth it's worth noting, and I, I, I say this a lot, and mm-hmm. it's it all people are always surprised. People think of Paso Robles as hot mm-hmm. because the days in the middle of the summer are hot, and there's no question. July and August, like it's hot. 105 <laughs> degrees, is not surprising. But the nights are cold mm-hmm. year round. The shoulder seasons are chilly. So September, October is almost always cooler in Paso Robles than it is in the Rhone. Mm -hmm. Same thing with May, June. So if you look at the average temperature where we are, it's cooler than it is in Chateau Nifty Pot. We pick the same grapes on average 10 days later than they do at Bocastel with the same sugars and higher acids. So if you ask the vines whether it's warmer or cooler, it's cooler. And we didn't realize that at the beginning. We were thrown by the fact that you walk outside and the middle of July and it feels like you're standing on the surface of the sun. (laughs) Um, But, and not enough attention to what's going on at four in the morning that same night where you're, you're asleep in bed. You don't notice that it's 52 degrees out. You don't notice that it doesn't seem as important that on October 15th, it got down to 34 Mm -hmm. um, and the high was only 71. And you get that last little bit of ripening very slowly and gradually. So I do feel like it's turned out to be a really good white wine region. Once people figured out, maybe we should be looking at whites from Mediterranean countries to plant there. Mm. So if people don't figure it out and, you know, the world comes to an end and you're sent to a deserted island, what three wines would you take with you? Do I have food too? Or does this have to be sustenance as well? as? Oh, it's your island. So it can be whatever (laughs) you want. It can have refrigeration. (laughs) Okay. So (laughs) people um, are always very concerned about how well whites and sparkling wines will last. I'm saying it's your island. What three wines? <laughs> <laughs> so I would love a, a Riesling with, with great acid and just a little hint of sweetness. Mm-hmm. I figure that'll be really good with the seafood that I'm going to have to scavenge off the, <laughs> off that desert island. Um, dry rosé because I mean, there's probably palm trees there to sit under and that's, uh-huh. that's the only appropriate wine to drink sitting under a palm tree. Sure. And then should I, should I manage to scavenge some sort of wild beast? Um, <laughs> I don't know, give me a give me a Morvedra. Give me a, a, a red with some earth and and meat and leathery characteristics to to go with that campfire. Okay, so I like that trio, and now I want you to pair those wines in those circumstances with music. It's a little game we always play. So, what would you want to be listening to while you're sipping your Riesling with good acidity and a little sweetness <laughs> with your seafood? <laughs> That feels like Mozart. <laughs> okay. And what about that rosé under the trees? Because that's really the only place you should be, only thing you should be drinking under a palm tree. <laughs> okay. For rosé, I feel like at that point, you're looking at something kind of instrumental and jazzy and something that's going to kind of go with the mood, something you don't need to pay too much attention to, but is going to be a 
it's gonna be good. It's gonna be a good accompaniment to to, to continue the continue the the, the the chill vibe. And then when you get into your meaty, earthy moved, <laughs> <laughs> um, that feels like something more dramatic. Yeah. But I'm not usually a huge fan of music as background to eating, uh-huh. um, and I'm not usually a huge fan of red wines without food. Okay. So. I don't know. I guess. I mean, I guess if I were doing it in that particular environment, I'd go with something maybe one of the one of the romantics, one of the romantic composers, maybe a Dvorak or a Tchaikovsky or yeah. the perfect background like that. music that you would barely notice was playing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Tough exercise. <laughs> I won't torture you with any more, although there are so many other wines I could ask you to pair it with, but I will leave you alone on that. You've had the pleasure to travel around the world and visit lots of regions, but is there one region that is one wine region that is at the top of your list that you want to explore? Yeah, actually, I would love to go to New Zealand. I've never, I mean, the, the, the scenery looks amazing. All mm-hmm. the people that I've met from there have been great. Um, I love the wines that I'm tasting and I've never been. So, well, you should pack your bags and start planning. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> well, while you're packing your bags and planning your trip to New Zealand, if people want to come visit you, um, how can they find you? Where can they find you? And what can they do when they visit Tablas Creek? So we decided pretty early on that the best way to get people inside this world that was pretty foreign to a lot of them was, was get them inside the process. So um, we do tours every day. We take people out to the vineyard farmed organically and biodynamically. We take people down to the grapevine nursery where we propagated all of those vines from scratch. We take them through the cellar and explain what we're doing. And so our tasting room is open seven days a week. It's in West Paso Robles. Um, all of us and whatever, 200 other great tasting rooms in Paso. And, and <laughs> do you need the, an appointment or can you just walk in? No, you can just walk in. Mm-hmm. We do. We ask people if they want to do a tour to, to make an appointment. Um, same thing if they want one of our seated kind of seated tasting experiences but but no we're just open anybody who wants to can just pull up and, and walk in we feel like that's important yep the the other thing is that you don't need to necessarily come out to get a sense of what Tablas Creek is about we do our best to, to kind of take our story out on the road I mean we do we we are around the country doing different sorts of things but also if you want to get a glimpse into what our world is like we write a blog every week um, that and you try to try to get the experience of being there, try to get people into the dilemmas that we're facing, the stuff that's keeping me up at night, the <laughs> things that we're really excited about. And we try to have as much of that as is possible, given the constraints of the formats in the different social media channels. So we're lucky enough that the shepherd who we hired to oversee our animal program is also a, an experienced videographer. Hmm. So we've been working a lot with video. Um, you can find we have a YouTube channel. You can find what we're doing on Vimeo or on our website. You want to get a sense of what a day in the cellar feels like. You want to get a sense of what that sabering to kick things off is like. You want to get a sense of what it's like to move the sheep from one vineyard block to another. We've got all that on video. Great. So start at tablascreek.com and plan your trip or, you know, just watch the videos and you then go. go to the store and buy some wine. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today on Wine Soundtrack and have a great day. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.